During World War II, the Germans gained a reputation for creating increasingly massive tanks. The 50-ton Tiger led to the 70-ton King Tiger. Then, in turn, there were a series of prototype vehicles, some built and some that remained as concepts, that eclipsed the Tigers. Perhaps the most famous was the Maus, a 175-ton behemoth, and two examples were actually built and captured by the Soviets at the end of the war. Finally, at the mega end of tank design was the gargantuan Ratter, a 1,000-ton vehicle that was both completely impractical and terrifying at the same time. But this tank megalomania did not start under the Third Reich. A quarter of a century earlier, the Germans had already started to push the envelope of tank design and actually build vehicles that have not been surpassed in size and weight even in 2019. I'm talking about the k Wagen, World War I's super tank. The tank was invented by the British in 1915 as a means to try and break the deadlock of trench warfare. Tanks first saw combat use in 1916 during the Battle of the Somme, when British Mark I's went into action. France also designed and constructed tanks, and between them, Britain and France constructed thousands but Germany was slow to appreciate the tank's usefulness and would build only 20 working examples that saw action in World War I. After the appearance of British tanks on the Somme in September 1916, the Germans had founded a committee to investigate tank development. What would become the A7V tank appeared a year later in September 1917. The first two Panzer units were founded shortly afterwards. The German name for their tanks was Sturmpanzerwagen, or Armoured Assault Vehicle. The A7V looked quite different to the British tanks of the period, being a tall armoured box on top of tracks. Weighing 30 tonnes and crewed by 18 men, the A7V was armed with a single 57mm gun and machine guns. Its armour was not impressive. The steel used in its construction was not hardened armour plate, it could not stop anything larger than rifle and machine gun bullets. Two centrally mounted Daimler four-cylinder petrol engines gave the A7V a top speed of 9 miles per hour or 15 kilometers an hour on roads and just 3 miles per hour or 5 kilometers off-road. Being tall meant a high center of gravity compared to British types, making the A7V prone to toppling over. The A7V entered combat in late March 1918 to little effect. They actually fought British Mark IV tanks at the Second Battle of Villa Bretonneau on the 24th of April 1918 in the very first tank versus tank engagement in history, when three A7Vs met three British tanks. One A7V was badly damaged. The Germans were also to rely increasingly on captured British tanks, the so-called Beuterpanzer, employing over 50 examples alongside their own armoured vehicles. So why were the Germans so against tanks in World War I compared to the great advances they made 25 years later? Tanks were expensive and the Germans preferred to rely on elite shock troops, the Sturmtruppen, to achieve breakthroughs in the Allied lines. The Allied naval blockade of Germany meant that the Germans did not possess the raw materials to churn out thousands of tanks like the British and French. German propaganda had labelled British tanks dishonourable weapons, and the deeply conservative Prussian Junker officer corps disdained such vehicles as beneath contempt and not in accord with their ideas of chivalrous man-versus-man combat though interestingly the Germans had embraced the machine gun, the aircraft and the U-boat with vigour. However, although the A7V tank project was rather half-hearted and unsuccessful, the Germans were already thinking big, very big. It was felt in some circles that tanks were most useful in breakthrough attacks, knocking a hole in the enemy's trench lines through which infantry could pour and exploit forward. 
While some generals still clung to the idea of using elite infantry, the stormtroopers, others had turned in their minds to the development of technology to solve this issue, in fact to ape the British and French. The A7V was clearly not the vehicle to do this. Instead, a concept called Gorskampfwagen, or Karwagen, or K-Wagen in English, was created at the German War Ministry in 1917. The designer of the A7V, Captain Josef Vollmer, produced an extraordinary design. The new design incorporated the proven lozenge shape for tanks used by the British. It had long-running roller-type track systems, but it was far in excess of anything the British or the French attempted to build. Designed in six modules that could be fitted together at the railhead, it consisted of a control room that had more in common with the bridge of a destroyer than a tank, a fighting room where gunners operated the K-Wagen's seven MG-08 machine guns, an engine room where the vehicle's two V6 Daimler petrol engines provided power so the 120-ton tank could travel at 4.7 miles per hour, or just 7.5 kilometers an hour. The two power packs were actually aircraft engines delivering 650 horsepower each and tied to an electric magnetic clutch transmission system, a transmission room and two sponsons mounting four 77mm fortress guns, the tank's main armament. Communications equipment was the same as that found in the wireless room on a German U-boat. Armour protection ranged from 10 to 30 millimetres thickness. An astounding 27 crewmen operated the K-Wagen consisting of a commander, two drivers, a signaller, an artillery officer, 12 gunners, 8 machine gunners and 2 mechanics. The army ordered 5 to be built by the Reber Ball Bearing Factory in Berlin and 5 by Wegmann and Co. in Kassel. When the war came to an end in November 1918, two of the tanks had actually been constructed with one K-Wagen named Reba complete and ready for service. But along with aircraft and submarines, post-war Germany was forbidden from possessing tanks under the terms of the Armistice and the later Treaty of Versailles. Both vehicles were scrapped in the factory under the supervision of officers from the Military Inter-Allied Commission of Control. So how good was the K-Wagen? It's difficult to say, as neither completed example was properly tested. But the vehicle was too large and heavy, and was time-consuming to get into action, as the thing would have needed to have been put together once offloaded from trains. It was loud and underpowered and very slow. The main guns had limited traverse. And being so large, the cave wagon would have been pounded to bits by Allied artillery fire. The armour itself was not sufficient protection against the heavier artillery shells. Did the Germans learn the lesson of the K-Wagen? Not really, because in World War II they poured time and resources into another tank white elephant, the Mouse. Even their largest tank that actually saw action in World War II, the Tiger II, had its limitations, caused by excessive size and weight. It was underpowered and too heavy for most bridges and prone to breaking down, though its armour protection was good and its main gun outstanding. The K-Wagen was the first attempt at designing and building a combat-capable super-heavy tank and was only surpassed in weight by the Mouse, the completed World War II super-tank. We shouldn't be too hard on the designer of the K-Wagen, for other countries also designed and built super tanks during World War I, and they were all failures. The British produced a concept known as the Flying Elephant, a 100-ton tank whose designer had realised that early tanks were very vulnerable to artillery fire. Although the Flying Elephant was well armoured, the project was abandoned from the prototype phase when it was realised that the tank was too slow in a mobile a similar problem to the K-Wagen. The French built the Shah 2C at 69 tonnes as big as the World War II Tiger II. Although the Shah 2C never saw action in World War I, they served in World War II as propaganda vehicles to demonstrate to the French population the massive power of French arms. However, the French army knew that they were out of date and kept them out of combat. These tanks were captured by the Germans. 
Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share, and also hit the bell icon for notifications of my latest videos. You can also help support my channel at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box. Thank you.